and welcome to Reintegrate. This guy over here is David Watney. Hey, everyone. And that guy who's just speaking is Dr. Bob Robinson, the executive director of Reintegrate. This is the Reintegrate podcast, uh, where we discuss the joys and frustrations of trying to live an integrated Christian life. And if you've been listening, then you know that Bob and I have great conversations with guests about culture, theology, faith, and work. And we come to these discussions from two generational perspectives. I am in my 20s, and Bob is in his 50s. And we've been friends for years, dating back to when I was a college student, a leader, and Bob was my campus minister. We believe that Jesus is the Lord of every square inch of life. There is no secular time and then sacred time. It all is meant to be sacred. Please subscribe to the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and connect with Bob and me through our website or our social media profiles. Uh, You can also check the show notes for details. One of the things that is not often uh, fully integrated for Christians is our engagement with culture. Andy Crouch in his must-read book, Culture Making, designates four postures that Christians historically have adopted towards culture. The four C's condemning, critiquing, copying, or consuming. He says that none of these should be our sole posture, but it might be better to see them as gestures used with discernment. Our guest on this episode is film critic Josh Larson, who will help us discern how movies are prayers and how to appreciate horror films. Applied to the movie industry, if all we do is condemn it as if all that it makes is utterly evil, then we will miss out on what God has provided for our edification through the common grace that he has bestowed upon filmmakers. Yeah, and if all we do is critique, then we might end up not enjoying entertainment for what is meant to be. And I really think it's cheesy when Christians try to merely copy what is in pop culture. And unlike the rest of the world, we shouldn't be mere consumers of pop culture, letting it just wash over us and influence us without a thought. I love it when we talk with guests about movies. So I'm really glad that we have Josh Larson on the podcast. He is the co-host of WBEZ in Chicago's radio show Film Spotting, which is also one of the top movie podcasts. And Josh is also the editor and producer for Think Christian, a website and podcast exploring faith and pop culture. He's been writing and speaking about movies professionally since 1994. Yeah, Josh is the author of two books that we will be talking about. The first is titled Movies Are Prayers, How Films Voice Our Deepest Longings. And his latest book is titled Fear Not, A Christian Appreciation of Horror Movies. Look in the show notes for links to Josh Larson's podcast and film reviews, as well as his social media. Hi, Josh. I've been a fan of your work for over a decade, and being a regular listener to the Film Spotting podcast. I've also enjoyed reading your film reviews on Letterboxd and Think Christian. And I've joined the Think Christian Movie Club. Hey, hey. Love hearing that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So I'm honored and glad that you're with us. I will want to dive into your more recent book, but before that, I want to revisit your previous one, the book Movies Are Prayers. You pack a lot into this small book. You identify nine types of prayers, and then you reference over 100 movies and place them within these categories. And so these prayers in order for our audience are praise, yearning, lament, anger, confession, reconciliation, obedience, meditation, and joy. So these are not in some random order. They match the story of God's redemption. What is this overarching meta narrative, and why did you frame your book based on this four chapter gospel? Yeah, that is probably due to my upbringing, my background, which is in the reform tradition, uh, more specifically the the Dutch reform tradition, and part of that accent, as uh, people often describe it is thinking of the human experience and God's story as falling along that trajectory and and the Bible itself 
following that trajectory. So you have you have creation, this world being created good. Then you have the fall, humanity falling into sin and and the world becoming corrupted as well. Uh, redemption, the turning point in human history with Christ's work on the cross. Um, but we're after that and yet, yet not in the fulfilled restoration. That's the new heavens and the new earth that the Bible ultimately points to. And so we find ourselves in, in that now but not yet phase. Uh, you know, theologians will often describe it that way. And uh, that is the story that I've grown up with of, as I said, you know, not only God's story of the world, but my place within it, you know, where, where do I personally fall along that timeline? Where do we all fall? We, we understand as Christians, you know, the larger universe existing along that timeline, but then we're each in our own place. Um, some of us may be in the praiseworthy creation place. Some of us may be in the fallen place. Um, and so it was the framework of how I think about everything and so it was natural to think about our prayer lives in this way and then movies as prayers in this way. Creation being like foundational. So so much of modern evangelicalism is kind of like the middle two chapters, fall and redemption, sin and salvation. Mm. But we kind of miss out on the, the, if we don't go with the first chapter, creation, and the last chapter, restoration, we miss the whole story on why the stories there in creational norms god made it a, a great creation calling it very good winding into that good creation all the potential to make stuff to create stuff including what movies that's right, right? <laughs> and so I movies so. are a creational thing and i mean we're, we're you know movie makers are are creating much like the creator God that they're made in the image of. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so if you don't have that, you kind of like, if all you see is sin and salvation, then you, you see movies as, oh, maybe that's sinful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think that does explain the, the attitude that is brought to, you know, po a lot of popular culture, not just film. Yeah. Josh, I wanted to go back to something that you said just a couple of seconds ago of um, movies being a prayer. So but why do you think movies are prayers? How did you come to that conclusion and what kind of sparked that thought? So the book lays out, you know, the theological argument for it a little bit. But honestly, it was born from the fact that I experienced movies this way. Not all the time, of course, not every movie. It's it's rare, but it feels miraculous. And the example that I often point to, uh, which connects with this idea, Bob, that you were just talking about, creation. And the goodness and recognizing that is uh, Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life. Um, you know, over 10 years ago now, this film came out, but I think one of the best films of the last 10 or so years, if not the best. And this is essentially the story of a family in 1950s Texas, father, mother, three boys, and how the father represents this stern law in a way, the mother represents a, a God's grace in a way. But what's amazing about this very domestic drama is Malik will cut away from it for beautifully filmed images of creation, the creation that this family experiences out in their yard among the trees, but also this astounding extended sequence that just jumps back to the creation of the universe. And we get this amazing nature imagery. We're thrust into um, really from the beginning of the universe to the arrival of humanity. A and I was watching that. I can remember distinctly in the Chicago press screening room, seeing this film, you know, before it was released in theaters. And as that sequence in particular was washing over me, feeling like I was experiencing the first chapter in Genesis, like I had never experienced it before. Of course, that is a story that we maybe know the most because it's the first one Christian kids are told. Um, but I had never experienced it quite this way. The awe and the wonder and the response to that for me was praise it is similar mm. to the sort of praise I feel is necessary when I'm out in nature. Um, experiencing the grandeur of God's creation firsthand, my response then is often praise, just awe, wonder, and praise. And that's what I felt during that sequence in particular of the tree of life. And it was in just a seed of interesting, interesting that um, 
this feels so much like those prayers of praise I offered out, you know, alongside a mountain trail, for instance. And the more I thought about it, I realized that, you know, there are other movies that made me feel something similar to lament, like those prayers of lament I've expressed um, or prayers of yearning. And all those categories you mentioned, Bob, I had instances where I experienced something similar watching the film that I did in offering a prayer of that kind. We can maybe unravel that even a little more of what you're going into of uh, we'd like to give our listeners a taste of what they'd read in your book, movies or prayers. So uh, maybe let's choose a few of these prayer types and you can tell us a movie that offers up this kind of prayer. So you mentioned praise. So maybe just starting there, uh, just a movie that kind of goes along with that. Sure. You know, the one I start with in that chapter is Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar. And, and this was written and the book came out before the Avatar sequel, The Way of Water. But I think that sequel applies too. Um, it has to do more with this idea of recognizing the goodness of God's creation. And I think, Bob, this speaks to what you were talking about in terms of filmmakers, artists of any kind, mimicking the creative act of God in what they make. For me, Avatar, it's such astounding world building. That is my favorite thing about this movie, both of these movies. Um, they're, they're not perfect. They have their issues, but I am captured each time by the world building that James Cameron and his animators um, manage to create here. It's just this, there's an unbridled vitality to the work. And the example I, I would give quickly is if you remember from Avatar, the first film, those massive, they're like islands that just hover in the air. They they have forests on them. They have waterfalls on them. These, these things are huge. And when the characters who come to this planet of Pandora for the are encountering them for the first time, they express this awe at seeing them. And that is brought about not by natural creation, but by humans, again, working in the same manner as God by imagining something and bringing it forth on the screen through the special effects. And you know, the kicker for me is when you revisit that movie, you realize the name of those mountains, the Hallelujah Mountains. So there had to be a reason that that was chosen because that's how it works for me. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, Avatar kind of works similarly as we've been talking about in terms of Genesis and creation and eliciting praise. So another one is um, you mentioned lament. Can you explain what lament is and then uh, maybe a movie that uh, connects with that? Sure. Yeah, lament, it was a you know a process of education for me for really understanding biblical lament because I think my instinct was this is sadness that we express, uh, maybe even um, frustration at some point. Um, but in you know, in, in thinking about it more, exploring prayers of lament in the Bible and what theologians have said about this, you realize that biblical lament, and you see this in the Psalms, has those things. It has deep sadness, maybe even despair, but there's always a looking forward in those prayers as well, a hope that um, and a trust that God will bring us out of this moment, out of that particular moment. And this is rooted toward, towards, you know, it's eschatological too, that God will bring the world out of its groaning into its but not, restoration. But not so quickly, right? I mean, that's you, why we you, have to lament. They, they soak, they soak in yes. the, the, the the despair and how long, oh Lord. And you just feel like, you know, you read a Psalm or, or Job and you're just like, oh, this is just bad. Absolutely. And, and it doesn't happen. You know, it's, it's not a quick, easy fix. Otherwise it'd be cheap, right? right. It would be right. sentimentality and it wouldn't be true to the human experience right. to just say, oh, you know, things are bad for you now. Well, just hang on a little bit. God will make it better. That's not lament. You're absolutely right. right. And so the movies that I think express lament are deeply difficult films. Take, for example, 12 Years a Slave, the 2014 Best Picture winner uh, made by a British filmmaker, Steve McQueen. And the story, um, if you remember, it focuses on Solomon Northup, who is a free black man in uh, 1840s New York, gets kidnapped and is taken into slavery in Louisiana. He's played by Chiwetel Ejiofor. And there is a sequence. A lot of times in movies, our prayers, I would focus not so much on an entire film, but a sequence in one that captured a type of prayer. And in 12 Years a Slave, this is a scene after Solomon has been on this plantation for a while. 
um, a fellow enslaved man has died in the fields from exhaustion. And so the community is burying him. And Solomon is standing apart from the rest of the enslaved people as they begin singing a spiritual roll Jordan roll. Some of you have seen the movie, maybe that, that brings this back to mind. And it's remarkable to me, this is to your point, I think, Bob, about how it doesn't come quickly or easily. Solomon is lamenting his state, the death of this man, but he's not participating in this song with the others because he is in that state of utter despair. And yet, without making it seem like everything's going to be okay, if you watch that scene closely, and I've done talks where I do a breakdown of this exact scene, you can trace Solomon from being distant from the group, not singing at all, not even looking towards them, to slowly beginning to mumble the words, then starting to sing them, then looking up at the heavens. And again, this doesn't solve everything, but in that you sense a little bit of hope, maybe, that is beginning to be born within him or a trust that this will not be the last day, despite this awful dark moment in both his personal history and American history. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be looking at films of lament that function as prayers of lament, you're going to be dealing with some difficult subject matter like this. You quote uh, Nicholas Wolterstorff in that chapter. So you're showing your your Dutch Calvinistic uh, roots there. There you go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that is his book on on lament, on on the, just the deep sadness that he had is just uh those words are just blew me away. So yeah, yeah, and helpful to me too in kind of understanding the, as you say, the depth of what right. biblical lament is. Right. So the next one we want to talk about, uh, maybe a movie that connects with confession, help us understand a prayer of confession that you see in the movie. A little bit lighter one this time, <laughs> Toy Story, one of the year, <laughs> uh, uh, Pixar film from many, many years ago, uh, still a wonderful one. And this is another one I've given talks and scene breakdowns with because I feel like Buzz Lightyear, the Space Ranger toy voiced by Tim Allen, experiences such a trajectory of confession over the course of this film because we meet him in full denial that he's not a toy. He is a space That's ranger. Right. And if you, I am not a toy. He's so adamant about it, right? He is so adamant about it. And there's that touching scene where he watches an ad on television for other Buzz Lightyears. And he begins to realize that how, the, the moment where it's like a disclaimer comes across the bottom, not a real toy. <laughs> it's, it's just like hitting it home for him. So I go on to trace his journey. Um, you mean not, it, not, not a real flying toy, right? That's, oh, what, that's what it is. Yeah. Not, not a real flying toy. Cause they, they don't want you to buy it. And then, you know, feel like you've got ripped off. Yeah. And, so, and so, and Buzz Lightyear's like not a flying toy. And so he jumps off something high and breaks his arm or something. Right. Yes. <laughs> and that's key because now is he not only a toy, he's a broken toy and he's a toy who, who needs to be part of a loving community um, he is not capable of solving all these problems as this heroic space ranger. And ultimately, he's needs to live in the grace of of Andy, the the boy who loves him. Um, and so seen within the context of a, you know, a a biblical understanding of confession, uh, I think Toy Story uh, is, you know, offers more rewards than all the other great laughs and wonderful groundbreaking animation that it has. It's an incredibly rich film. All the Toy Story movies are very funny and very moving. Yeah, they, they get to you, right? They really do. Yeah, I mean, I I grew up with those movies. The first one came out right around, like, I was their target audience. So, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so when it came out, that movie was for me. And then it's like my whole generation kind of grew up with Andy. Yeah. And all like, oh, we're playing with our toys. And then we're, oh, yeah, now I'm going to college and I have to get rid of all of, all of my toys and um, wow. And coming back to it. So it's kind of growing up with that. But I never thought about seeing confession in Toy Story. And that's so interesting to me, you know, until, you know, look through your book. It it does resemble a lot of coming to terms with the limitations. But then I love mm. what you said of needing the community and 
yeah, I mean, Buzz needed the other toys around him. Otherwise, he didn't know what to do with himself. And he has that whole mental breakdown with the tea party and he's smashing yes. his arm on the table. He, <laughs> yes. he doesn't know what to do with himself because he needs that community and he needs um, people around him to say, hey, it's OK. And thanks for coming to the realization that you needed to. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I never thought about that, even growing up on Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were probably, you know, the first time you saw it, not thinking about right, the no. theological <laughs> themes in, <laughs> in your movies, no. which is understandable. I was just in awe. Well, another topic, you end with uh, joy, mm. which is which is restoration, right? So joy. Uh, so t- tell us some movies about joy. What? How do uh, movies feel like prayers of joy? I'm going to talk about the one I just had a chance to revisit. Uh, Bob, you mentioned you joined the the TC Movie Club and uh, we're meeting on March 6th. I don't know if this will be out before then, but we're meeting online to talk about the films of Hayao Miyazaki, a Japanese animator and in the context of creation care. And so I've been revisiting a number of his movies and was able to watch My Neighbor Totoro an early one of his with a college group at Biola University last month. And it was so fun seeing it with a crowd and on a big screen. And so it's fresh in my mind, um, the the joy that this movie can offer. And, you know, I think if you provide some context here and and look at biblical joy, uh, it, to me, it captures two things. Okay. It's, it describes God's creative prowess. So it's related to praise in some way, recognizing the joy of this world we've been given, the life we've been given. But then it looks not only back in that way, but it looks ahead to God's saving grace and anticipates the joy of the life to come, the joy of the restoration of earth. And so it's kind of looking back and forward at the same time. It's I describe it as being historical and eschatological. And so we can experience that even as we're looking forward, right? We can experience it now, those glimmers of how it used to be and how it will be. And I think we see glimmers like that in my neighbor, Totoro, which is the story of two young sisters. They move to a new home in the country and end up meeting these forest spirits and learning to find delight, even though they too are in a state of sadness. They've moved with their father because their mother is in a nearby hospital. It's never quite explained exactly what her sickness is, but it's serious. It's affecting this family deeply. And in the midst of this, these forest spirits, including Totoro, bring joy into their lives. And another scene I focused on is when the girls are waiting in the rain at a bus stop for their father to come home from work in the middle of the deep woods. It's very dark because of the storm. There's one street light, you know, kind of above them and they just look so despondent. And then all of a sudden appearing next to them is Totoro, who who looks like, if you haven't seen it, kind of a, a giant bear slash cat creature, <laughs> very round, very soft, but a little scary. He's got a big mouth too, um, but he just stands next to them. And I won't continue to break down this scene, but it delightfully brings joy. Totoro brings joy to the moment. Uh, a lot of the lighting use of animation here, the lighting and the animation is key. The way an umbrella and the raindrops are falling upon the umbrella become a little game for the three of them. Um, all of this to me expresses how even in the midst of this emotional upheaval that these girls are experiencing, uh, they can also feel deep seated delight, deep seated joy at the the beauty of the rain um, and also sort of a hope that, um, you know, things will be better than this. So it's it's somewhat similar to lament, but almost more deeply rooted, I think, for Christians at least, in in this true faith and not even not even hope, but like deep belief and excitement. Maybe that's the difference uh from lament, where it's hope mm. that things will get better and joy is maybe an excitement and an actually you feel a thrill in that confidence that things will get better. You almost feel like you're getting a taste of it. You know, you're not just hoping for it. When you have, when you feel that joy, you're really getting a taste of it. Like Totoro shows up just to bring joy into these little girls' lives. And just, what, 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 yeah. what is, what she is he does. doing maybe, here? Maybe. She, she or, yeah, he or yeah. she <laughs> just kind of shows up and, and it's just like, his movies are just so weird. <laughs> <laughs> they are very strange. This is absolutely true uh, in, in kind of delightful ways and then sometimes disturbing ways, sometimes, frankly, gross ways. <laughs> I think if he's new to listeners, uh, My Neighbor Totoro is a good place to start, I would suggest. Yeah, it's also a I good one so. for younger viewers. 
Um, and then others of his are, you know, are a bit more bizarre. That's for sure. Spirited Away was something of a breakout, which came later and, you know, got Oscar attention. And right. that is quite, quite a strange one, but also wonderful. Yeah. Spirited Away. I, my daughter loves this director. So we watch okay. all these movies together and nice. And she, she showed me that Spirited Away. And I was just like, so what hallucinatory, hallucinatory <laughs> drugs did this guy take? <laughs> made this movie. It, can, it can feel a little bit like that. And, and I should say, you know, Miyazaki had his uh, a new film come out at the end of the year, The Boy right. and the Heron. It might still be in theaters. Yeah. It was also nominated for a Best Animated Feature Oscar. And it, it was my favorite film of 2023, there actually. So after almost a decade of, um, you know, taking a pause, saying he was retired, he came back with the boy and the heron, uh, and it's 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 just exquisite. His animation is just beautiful. It's, Absolutely, it's, yeah. It's it's something you've never seen before in any other kind of movie. And yep. this is this is not Disney. <laughs> no, no, nope. So you wrote your new book by way of Fuller Seminary's Bream Center for Integrating Worship, Theology, and the Arts. I took a doctoral course. Taught by Craig Detweiler there at Fuller oh, yeah. called I know Theology, Very cool. Theology, Theology of Pop Culture is a doctoral course. It was amazing. Uh, Craig and I have become friends ever since, and and he's been on the podcast. Uh, Fuller is definitely on the cutting edge of engaging with culture. I love that place. Yes. So good work your, there. So your book's title is Fear Not, a Christian Appreciation of Horror Movies. Wait a minute. <laughs> I ask this not to be confrontational, but to allow you to explain, as you do so well in the book. Can Christians appreciate horror movies? Should Christians appreciate horror movies? I mean, this is the question that's so frequently asked. It's why the good folks at Fuller, you know, wanted a book in their monograph series addressing it, especially as horror, you know, is only getting increasingly popular, has always been, especially for young audiences. You know, the, the obvious answer I'm going to give is can Christians? Yes, of course they can. Um, should they? No, it doesn't mean everyone has to. And then this applies to movies or prayers as well. You know, this is where discernment comes in. We, we all need to do our personal work of discernment, I would say. And this comes to play particularly for horror movies because they deal in challenging material. Many of them, I will admit up front, are exploitative. Um, exploitative of sexuality, exploitative of violence, uh, exploitative of religious elements. Uh, you know, I mean, there there are so many horror movies that um, are set in a religious context, but don't take that seriously. Just just use it kind of um, to 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 kind of needle people. Yeah. And so I understand the hesitation. So this is really a question of discernment, right? And we're we're doing we need to do our own personal discernment and mm -hmm. recognize that those exploitative elements are real and there may be reasons why we should not watch that or another person should not watch that um, for issues of temptation or what, whatever it might be. And we need to honor and respect that. So the so the book, Fear Not, is something of an argument for yes, Christians can watch it, um, but then it is also an exercise in how one way to watch it um, yeah. that is in a way that that will be hopefully in a discerning manner. And discernment isn't done on your own. You need to be with some friends and figure this stuff out, uh, because the person we fool the most is ourselves. And we we're like, exactly. I can watch, I can watch this, exactly. I can enjoy this, and and you're watching and enjoying it, and you're like, maybe Jesus doesn't want me to be watching this. You're right, and there's, you know, it, it can be obviously it can be a partner, a spouse, a good friend. It could be a, yeah. you know, a movie club. This is why I love hearing that churches have movie clubs. Um, because this is the work being done together in community. I don't know how many church movie clubs are watching horror movies, but it's it's kind of the same the same point, saw, you know. Saw three at your local Baptist church, <laughs> yeah, right? I, I doubt it, and it probably wouldn't recommend it in that case. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I have to admit, I do like a good horror zombie movie, okay, uh, or, or you know, TV show uh, Night of the Living Dead, which I, I know you know, you reference and, uh, walking dead, the last of us recently, that was a popular one that I enjoyed watching, but it, it does instill this, this, this sense of fear. And so I wanted to kind of have you talk about what fear do zombie movies or TV shows reveal to us and, uh, how can we best face that fear? 
Yeah. So you're, you're kind of um, pointing at the structure I gave for this book. As you can tell, I, you know, I, I like to have a structure for a project this big. And so I did look at these subgenres of horror movies, um, horror, horror, the horror genre is rich with subgenres, all different variations and zombies are one of those. And I thought what would be interesting is um, recognizing that horror and fear is in the Bible. I mean, the title of the book comes from, you know, a, a phrase in the Bible. The Bible does not turn a blind eye to fear. Rather, it has horrifying elements to it for, for what reason I feel is like so that we can deal with them and so that we can recognize them, have some cathar catharsis there, and also ask, what is the Bible's response to these fears um, that, that we hold? How is the gospel a source of comfort for these fears? So I did try to look at each subgenre and ask, first of all, okay, what common fear do a lot of the movies in this subgenre explore? And it doesn't mean every movie, every zombie movie explores this, but to me, it seemed like most of them explored um, this fear of losing our individuality, right? We become this uh, horde when we, we join the zombie horde, in other words, and the way this connects to Christianity is with the idea of the Imago Dei. Um, God created us uh, in God's image. So there's something that is holy about each individual human being. But we also know um, when we're told that uh, we have been knitted in the womb, that we are created as individuals. So to see someone in a zombie movie, and it's always the turn for me that becomes the most horrible. When when a character we've been following and come to care for does get bitten or however it's transferred in the movie you're watching, um, they begin to turn into a zombie. There's a lot of horrifying things about that. But from a deeper Christian theological perspective, you can see that individuality, that imago da draining from them. And I think that just, it, there's like an existential level to uh, these movies that are otherwise kind of just considered gross. <laughs> For me, there's a lot more to it. Yeah, I mean, the zombies just have a, a dead look on their face. Their, their eyes are dead and there, there's yep. nothing, there's no humanity there anymore. And so that's, that's the most horrifying thing of all is that this person that you loved, you know, maybe a family member, is no longer that person. It's the humanity's gone. Exactly. Yeah. Our last guest was Dr. Carmen Imes, who is who wrote just wrote a book on the the image of God, and and so it's it connects this episode with that episode nice. because because it's like who are we? Mm. We are the image of God. That's mm -hmm. that's the the title of her book is being God's image, and and so it's like that's who we are, and if that's taken away from you, oh yeah. Yeah, if that's if that's drained as it looks like as you describe when you see those eyes change or um absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 a terrifying thought. So I grew up watching those old universal movies on late night movie show uh called Hool Han and Big Chuck or later Big Chuck and Hool uh, Little John here in, okay. in Cleveland. <laughs> WJW Channel 8 it was a late night TV show. It was so it was so popular that it had better ratings than the tonight show with Johnny Carson. Wow. That's great. <laughs> so they would show Frankenstein and Dracula, the Wolfman, the creature yeah. from Black Lagoon. That's where I saw all those movies. Is, is that's on the that good show. stuff. <laughs> so, so what fear do these monster movies reveal to us and why should we face that fear? Yeah, this, this one, I had so much fun um, revisiting these movies because they're probably some of the first horror films I can remember watching too. And, and I should say they're a good entry point, I think, for people who are maybe hearing this conversation and have never even considered watching a horror movie, um, but are intrigued by some of these ideas. A way in might be some of these older, as you said, largely universal horror films from the 30s and 40s. Maybe uh, maybe the, the Abbott and Costello version. <laughs> yeah, you can see that move one? on to that for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I just I just saw that on, on TV just not too long ago. I'm like, there's the Wolfman in Abbott and Costello. <laughs> Probably an even easier entry point. But That's but right. you know, they're not they're not really like terribly scary. Um, there's there's not a lot of gore. You have to, you know, realize you're watching a film from you know 80 years ago or whatever, and and there's gonna be different special effects such as they are, but also some beautiful production design and cinematography, the black and white and the sets in these movies. So anyway, that's my pitch for just them as movies. 
but yeah, when I was looking at these in terms of, okay, these monster movies, what, what's the fear? Uh, it struck me that it was the fear of our own capacity for sin. So in these ways, these movies are, are troubling. They're going to challenge you. Um, you know, the, the zombie movie is, is kind of a fear that's coming from the outside in the, the possibility that we'd lose our Imago DA and monster movies, the fear is coming from the inside out. And I, I rooted a lot of my observations in the chapter on monster movies around Romans, um, including Romans seven fifteen. you know, the apostle Paul saying, I do not understand what I do or what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And there's no better example of this than the Wolfman, right? It's almost like this, this myth had been created to, to, to exemplify what Paul is struggling with here, what we all struggle with, this knowledge of what we want to do, but our brokenness, um, meaning that we're still going to sin. Um, if you watch the Wolfman that I look at, which again is the universal one with Lon Chaney Jr., it, this is a guy who, who is fighting against being the fact that he's been bitten by this other werewolf and is now turning into this killer. He's trying, there's a scene where he even chains himself, um, to a chair, has himself chained to a chair to try to prevent him from killing again. Uh, a wonderful scene where he, after a night of, of killing the camera pans from the windowsill and his muddy footprints uh, are there. And the camera traces them across the rug to his bed where he's back in human form. Um, just kind of nailing down that yet yeah, this is you. Um, you did this. And so wrestling with that and confronting that and admitting that is at the root of the Wolfman. And I think so meant to very different degrees, um, of these monster movies that you mentioned. Yeah. Dr. Frankenstein is, uh, is really the, the, the scary one, not the monster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the sin there is like, you know, it's the God complex movie, right? I can oh, yeah. become God and I, I can, um, I can mess with creation <laughs> is, is what, um, which, you know, we're, we don't all have, um, cavernous labs that we're conducting experiments in, but, but we tend to think like we can bend the world to our will, uh, in various right. ways. And so, uh, in that way, and, and when we, if we recognize that, you know, the way it connects to fear is like, that's scary. Um, we're scared of ourselves in a way, uh, scared of what we're capable of. Um, even those of us um, who believe we are walking a life of faith, that does not mean um, that we've been, you know, perfected or are incapable of sin in this world. And so it's troubling to and scary to be forced to recognize that. Yeah, my uh, my dad loved Creatures of the, of the Black Lagoon, and nice. yeah, he showed it to me when I was little. And, uh, you know, of course, when I was younger, I don't think I really appreciated it. I remember just watching it being like. Oh, these graphics are horrible. Like what in the <laughs> world? There's yeah. no CGI in this and <laughs> I know <laughs> and all of these things. But it it was like as I got older, I, I watched it again. And I what I did appreciate was kind of like this this unknown settling feeling. And like mm. they I feel like in a lot of older movies too, they did like the the point of view from like the camera being the point of view from the monster. Mm -hmm. or, and uh that was always so unsettling to me because it's like, ooh, I'm seeing this person walk that I know I'm going to go after, and this person's yeah. in danger now. Yeah. So it was this sense of unknown that almost made the movie terrifying. For sure. <laughs> and the way you describe it connects, you know, to the to the fear of making us complicit by choosing that camera angle. We are now the monster. We're literally the monster because we're looking at, you know, in that case, the woman scientist taking a swim and, and the creature is hiding among the seaweeds and, mm -hmm. and we know that we're watching her. And so that's, you know, in some sense, confronting you with, um, with lustfulness, right. That, that, mm -hmm. that you have to wrestle with that potential within you and putting us in the eyes of the, of the creature of the monster is a very effective cinematic technique for doing that. The slasher films do that sometimes, or is it Friday the 13th yeah. or Halloween that does that? Yeah, both of them, actually. Yeah. It's interesting. Both movies open, um, their opening scenes have bits from uh, the, the killer's point of view. That's disturbing. Yeah, it gets to you, right? I, 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 mean, don't, want to yeah. be, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> It can be overused in the horror genre. Absolutely. But yeah, in, in some of those landmark films and, and actually Friday the 13th is, you know, a pretty terrible movie. I do write about it in the book, uh, but Halloween is a far more accomplished, effective um, uh, film. And, and both do, though, use that technique. 
Yeah, I just recently for the first time uh, watched Friday the 13th. I never saw it when I was younger and I decided, hey, I've never seen this movie and I watched it and I was like, wow, this movie is terrible. <laughs> uh, the storyline is weird. It and, really uh, is. And I mean, it's, it's interesting it's, for its legacy, you know, if yes, nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> um, not only all the sequels it spawned, um, but also, you know, as, as I talk about, I talk about it, it is a slasher film. But I also talk about it in the context of the sex and death chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and very much Friday the 13th about, is about our, you know, fear of sexuality, too. So so mm -hmm. in an influential film, unfortunately, not a very well-made one. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the bad one of the big three, right? Yeah, Friday the 13th, but, but, but uh, Halloween and uh, Nightmare on Elm Street are mm -hmm. pretty good movies, aren't they? Yeah, in my opinion, um, yeah, it's, it belongs nowhere near those other two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, I often cite as my favorite horror film of all time. I, I think it's it's just such a disturbingly surreal one, for sure. Mm. Yeah, so that's kind of a good transition of talking about like the realness and kind of ha having that mess with your head a little bit <laughs> of getting to religious horror <laughs> mm. um, and that whole topic. So. Uh, Bob and I were talking a little bit before we actually started recording the podcast and we were talking about religious horror films and, you know, he had asked me if I'd seen The Conjuring and I said, no, actually, I've never seen The Conjuring. And and one of the reasons I was thinking of about like, why haven't I seen that movie is for some reason, I think it's just like the way I grew up or whatever it might be. I kind of just drew this line of like. I want the scary movie I'm watching to have a sense of, ah, this is fake. This is fake. Ah. But then on the other side of that line is like, ooh, no, there is this spiritual warfare. There is this like, we see some some scary things that you can read in the Bible that you're like, what was that? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's unsettling. That's unnerving. And so it's a sense of reality meets horror and like this is actually happening. So it's just something I've stayed away from um w with the genre but i mean i've heard that there's some great movies but uh so why do you think that religious horror does so well um in the box office and has that that large appeal to so many people i think you're touching on it i, I think it works differently for different audiences which means it works for a, a massive audience if it's it's um reaching different sort of folks so you do have uh, people with a religious background um, doesn't even have to be a Christian background, although most religious horror films are rooted in that Catholicism specifically, I would say, but, you know, for, for believers, let's just say these movies can be reminders of exactly what you are talking about, David, you know, the, the dark world that the apostle Paul talks about as, as being very real, depending on your religious tradition. Um, and certainly mine, this was not something we talked about. This, this was something that was, you know, not really preached upon the, those passages you reference in the Bible. We'll just kind of glide past those. Um, but what we find there is that the spiritual realm is a real thing. And it is, it is a battle. It is a warfare. As you said, it is, it is dark and it is dangerous. And so I think for religious believers that can be deeply unsettling to see a horror movie that reminds us of that. Now let's flip to those who are coming without any religious context, wouldn't describe themselves as people of faith at all. Um, a religious horror film, and this applies to the one that are the ones that are done well, right? The hokey ones aren't going to be this effective, but the ones that are done well do something similar. They remind people, or they at least suggest to these folks that there might be a spiritual realm. If they're really effective, that is going to be incredibly unsettling because the, you may be a person who's like, I, I deal in science. I deal in things we can scientifically scientifically measure. I deal in reason, all good things. But then what happens if the door is cracked open um, to, well, but maybe, but just maybe. And so the, the overarching thing about religious horror films is that to me, they're about revelation. They're about revelation in two ways. They're revelation for believers, they're revelation for non-believers. And, and the fear is the same for both groups, right? The fear they're exploring is just this basic fear of a spiritual realm, because as believers, we can say, oh, of course there is one, you know, it's in the Bible. It's, you know, but kind of, it was a long time ago. It's not really now. And then when you see, especially a modern set religious horror film, you realize, well, it doesn't necessarily mean it was just 
back then. Um, so yeah, they're they're very revelatory films for a lot of different audiences, and I I think that's that's one reason for their extreme popularity. You quote um, is it Holloway and and Taylor who wrote a, who uh, talk about Charles Taylor's right. idea that there was once a, not too long ago people believed that there there wasn't a whole lot of difference. There, there there's a porousness between the spiritual world and our world, and now it's yeah. like yeah, yeah that is that is not real. And so these movies might be used by God to help people realize there's a realness here. That's really fascinating. They introduce, yeah, they reintroduce. Um, it, it's a great word that's used. I forget it's, if it's in Taylor's book or, or um, yeah, the one that I referenced that's quoting from it. But the porousness, right? They, these movies can bring that porousness back to the forefront for us. So I, I don't know exactly what it is about ghost movies. But nothing gives me that crawling sensation up my spine than when a ghost appears <laughs> in a movie. And, you know, it's like, I shouldn't be afraid of this. You know, I'm, I'm a theologian. I, I don't believe in ghosts, do I? And, <laughs> but ghost movies really, I mean, when when a ghost appears, it's just like, I just go, Bleh! So what do ghost movies reveal to us? I mean, if you look at, and that's that's funny to hear, I think everyone has their own type of horror movie that really gets to them. So. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but yeah, ghost stories, you know, so many ghost stories, the ghosts are often accusing a guilty party, right? They come back to indict someone among the living for something they've done. And so not all, but so many of our ghost movies are about our fear of guilt. And I spent a lot of time on the M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Sixth Sense, a huge hit for him, um, being an exploration of guilt in a couple ways. And, and maybe I shouldn't go into that in case there's anyone out there who has not seen The Sixth Sense. It's famous for its twist. <laughs> Spo- I'm not, let's it's just move spoiler, on. Spoiler let's alert. Let's just move on. No spoilers. I don't think there can't be a soul alive that doesn't know be, the but, spoiler. But I still <laughs> don't want to be that person. <laughs> But I you didn't know, see this movie is... till pretty late in life. And it, okay, there you see, there you like, go. I think I was like 16 when I saw it, and I yeah. was shook because no one had ever told me about it. I knew there was a twist. Right. And then yeah, when I saw it at 16, I think it was around that age, I was like, yeah, it shook everything for me. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you were able to have that that experience. So even we'll just say the sixth sense, a ghost story, does explore guilt of some kind. And um, you know, the gospel. Above all, here we can maybe turn a little bit to, you know, how the Bible speaks to these fears. The gospel speaks to our guilt. And it, it's interesting to me, you know, there are ghosts in the Bible. We can, you know, that's maybe a whole nother podcast, Bob, we can talk about yeah. <laughs> what, what, what do we make of, of this idea of ghosts. There are ghosts in the Bible, but how, there are way more verses about relieving us of our guilt. Um, this is of primary concern in the Christian story. Uh, Romans 5, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 8, therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This this is the message. And in a lot of ghost stories, um, they do not offer that message. Let's just say (laughs) many ghost stories stay in the place of guilt and quite frankly, punishment. Um, I think the sixth sense, again, is distinctive in this way where it finds itself to a place of confession and forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, I think that's, that's one reason I wanted to write about it um, so much in, in fear not uh, because a lot of our ghost stories are about exposing that guilt and delivering that punishment. Um, So this is a case of, you know, and this happens a fair amount and in the book where not every subgenre offered me a chance to say, here's how the Bible answers that fear and look at this movie that works in a similar way. Um, But when I was able to, and in the case of the sixth sense, it was particularly rewarding. So I don't know if that's why you find um, ghost movies troubling Bob, or or if it's just that ghosts are spooky to you, but, but that's, that's the direction I went. I don't, I never want to ride a big wheel in a mansion. I just (laughs) turn a corner and there's these little little twin girls. (laughs) <laughs> the Shining, right? And and it's interesting, you know, to bring that up. Like I, I write about The Shining in the horror on psychological chapter, but it is a ghost story. It's absolutely a ghost story, um, as well. So yeah, a lot of these, a lot of the movies I cover, you know, especially the really good ones you find, um, incorporate elements from multiple subgenres because they're just yeah. so rich and and taking on so many ideas. 
So you wrote a book on on horror, and you wrote a book on movies as prayers. What's your next project? Well, I am um, taking a break <laughs> and just enjoy not having a project uh, because both experiences were so rewarding to do. Uh, I just love, you know, it, it's just a different form of thinking theologically about film. Um, I, I do it every day, not just film, but movies, uh, but TV, I should say, music, video games uh, over at Think Christian, where I'm editor. But it's in the form of, you know, blog posts that I edit or mm -hmm. we have a podcast as well. So conversations we have on the podcast. And those are all good, but they're different than really burrowing in to a question, an idea, devising the structure that we've kind of talked about that will support a book length project. And so I love doing it, but it requires a lot. So a right lot now I'm of just kind of, right? yeah, I'm just, I'm just kind of catching my breath, but I, I would love to do something like this again someday, just because it's not only the work itself, but it, it honestly, it's then these conversations, you know, getting a chance um, and the horror one's been interesting because I think even as you said, David, early on, like, yeah, horror is something like I, I really, I really appreciate, or I, I really like certain movies and I've had more people say that to me and not that you did, but sometimes other people, it's almost feels a little confessional that they'll be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know what? I actually do watch horror. I like yeah. <laughs> and so it's kind of, you know, if movies are prayers, the idea was yeah. largely this has been for a hundred years now, a major cultural experience, movie going, um, mm -hmm. let's not pretend Christians don't do it. Now, some people have chosen not to, right? And and may have good reasons for that. Some Christians have made that choice, but by and large, Christians are watching movies. They, they, may, they may not be talking about it as much, um, but if we're doing this, then let's, let's think about some ways we can do it, um, you know, as disciples. And so fear not is just kind of taking that in a little dicier territory, I guess. <laughs> it is. And we've had, uh, like I said, we had Craig Detweiler on uh, talking about movies. We had, uh, not too long ago, we had Richard Vance Goodwin on, who wrote a, a book on uh, God being revealed in movies. His favorite nice. movie is Magnolia, and we talked about that movie. And okay, that yeah. Was he said, it, it was a God experience for me when I saw Magnolia, mm. so that's why he wanted to write a book about how God reveals himself through. There film. you go. And, uh, and so we, yeah, this is something we talk, like to talk about on this podcast. And I love listening to your podcast film spotting as well. Yeah, your radio you. show from uh, Chicago. And, and it's fun because Adam Kepinar, your, your co-host oftentimes will yield to you. If there's like a, a religious aspect to a movie, you'll say, so Josh, what do you think of this? Uh, yeah, he'll, he'll do that from time to time. I do try to, you know, as you said, that airs on the NPR station here in Chicago. So it's meant for um, a more mainstream audience. Absolutely. Right. So, so I, I, I try not to like hijack that. And, and I want to speak to the audience who is listening, which is made up of course of Christians as well, but it's nice that I do have think Christian as an outlet where I can kind of narrow in on that uh, theological vantage point as well. I, I do enjoy uh, being able to keep a foot in, in both worlds as it, as it were, even though the, my understanding is that there's no real separate, there's no real separation there, but, right. but sometimes in, in terms of audience, it's helpful to think that way. I think it's, it's honoring. I, I find it very honoring that Adam does that because it's like, he respects who you are and he respects that you are a legitimate film critic like he is. And we could talk about these things and we can argue about these things and we can agree and disagree. And yet there's times when he's like, this isn't really my expertise. Can you help me mm. on this? It's fun to hear when he does that. Well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, thank you for, for listening as long as you have. I appreciate it. Yep. So thanks for joining us on this podcast. And if you, if you want to find uh, film spotting, it's on every podcasting app. Thanks for being with us. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, Bob. Thanks, David. Good to talk to you both. Yep. yep. Good to talk to you. Scary movies. Should we watch those? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There are some where I'm like, no, too much, too much. Turn it off. And then there's yeah. some other ones like, like I do love Halloween. Halloween's probably my favorite, like slasher film. <laughs> I just I love the storyline. I think it's very well done. But the original one or all the sequels? I like I like the original one, but 
then like I like the original few, and then it like went off and did like a whole bunch of weird spinoffs. I didn't like any of those. <laughs> and then I didn't like it until it came back with Jamie Lee Curtis of when they like relaunched it in like 2017, 2018 or whatever. Because I'm like, ooh, I like this storyline of he's been in jail for the whole 40 years and now he's breaking out. And I'm like, ooh, this is a good storyline. And I thought those movies were actually really well done. But yeah, because they made Halloween. Halloween Ends was like the last one because they killed him, quote unquote, until they probably reboot it in like five years. But <laughs> so Halloween Ends was the latest one. And then before that it was Halloween Kills, okay. I think. And that was the one where he like comes back. After like 40 years of being in jail. He's wearing a William Shatner mask. <laughs> yeah. And I like just learned that like last year, I never knew that. And then I read an article that it was actually a William Shatner mask that like they didn't use. And that, so he wore it and they were like, yeah, that's creepy. We'll just keep you wearing that. <laughs> that looks creepy. <laughs> that's pretty creepy. You swear that. I wonder how William Shatner feels about that. Like, wow, my face is that scary. Jeez. Exactly. Which insurance company did that commercial about the, the they're all running away and, and it, uh, yeah, yeah. let's hide in the chainsaw with the, behind the chainsaw. So well, why can't we just get in the running car? Right. Right. <laughs> right. And like the moment they're like, okay, everybody split up. I'm like, yeah, this is where you're all dead. You're all dead. Good job, everybody. <laughs> Like, oh, let's go down and check out this creepy basement. Like, have you seen a movie before? Like, 